Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Reason and Theology. Your host, Michael, joined by Dr. Jim Papandrea, returning guest. And we're talking about his book, Reading the Church Fathers, A History of the Early Church and Development of Doctrine. You can get a link to it um, right there in the show notes where you can go and purchase a copy. So I'm really excited to talk about this because one of my favorite topics is talking about the Church Fathers. So really excited Me to too. have you, Dr. Jim. How are you? And welcome back to the show. Uh, I'm I'm great. Thanks for asking. Uh, happy uh, Happy Easter. Um, although I I don't like to call it Easter because the the Church Fathers, the early Christians, didn't call it Easter. So Happy Resurrection Day, I guess. Uh, yeah, but, they called uh, they yeah. called it Pascha. You know, exactly. Christ, yeah, we say in the East we say Christ is risen. So Christ is like risen indeed. Pretty, yes. Yeah, indeed. So yeah, really excited about this. So let me first before we dive into the book itself, and, and it covers a lot of ground. I have to commend you for how much you covered here. But before we talk about specifics, tell me a little bit why you felt it was necessary to write this book. Yeah, well, this is actually the second edition of a book I had written earlier mm -hmm. um, that is uh based on the lectures that I give in my introduction to church history class. Mm, mm -hmm. And I've been teaching that class, uh, you know, consistently for, you know, over 15 years now, almost 20 years. Yeah. And, um, you know, early on, uh, you know, I, I sort of turned the lectures into the book and the book is written very, it's very accessible for anyone to read it. So you don't have to sure. be a scholar to read it. In fact, that's kind of the point of an intro class is, you know, the students coming in, are, are beginners in the subject. And so I needed a really, you know, concrete uh, kind of collection of everything they would need, which really, really didn't exist out there. And so mm. uh, I wrote the original and then uh, a while back, I was able to do a revised and updated version mm -hmm. based on, you know, another 10 years or so of teaching. And, um, and, and it's worked out really well. And, you know, uh, it's getting, getting some good, Good feedback. So it's a good traction. That's good. And, you know, one of the things that you talk about early on in the book is the apostolic fathers. Can you introduce us to the apostolic fathers? Who are they? Why are they important? Who are some names that we should know? Stuff like that. Yeah. Well, so, you know, the apostolic fathers is kind of a, a, a name we call a collection of the earliest church fathers um, after the apostles. And so there's this sort of window of time when the apostles are are dying off or have gone, um, and yet there are still some people around who knew them. And so, you know, we're we're thinking about people like Clement of Rome, one of the early bishops of Rome, or um, even Ignatius of Antioch, and um, and then you know even even when we get into Irenaeus, we're sort of beyond the apostolic fathers, but but now only two generations away or two you know, two la layers of discipleship away from the apostles. And so, um, so it's really, you know, uh, it, it's really what I call Christianity, the next generation, you know, it's that next generation of leaders after the apostles, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I think the one who stands out the most to me, well, there's multiple ones, but would probably be Irenaeus. Can you maybe briefly talk about him and his importance? Yeah, Irenaeus is is really important because he is, in my mind, he's the first real theologian of the church after the apostles, right? Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. you know, after the apostles, we have some some very important writers, but they tend to be uh, pastors, bishops, um, or apologists. The apologists like Justin Martyr is one of the famous ones. They're writing primarily to an audience outside the church. Mm. But when we get to Irenaeus, now he's writing primarily to an audience inside the church, and he's writing in response to heresy, and so he has to clarify orthodoxy, um, and he has to warn uh, Christians about heresy, and so we really begin to get uh, what we call, you know, this, this development of doctrine or the clarification of biblical doctrines being sort of put together into um you know the beginnings of of what what would be a more systematic theology or a more doctrinal theology you know another figure that stands out for me is ignatius of antioch i remember reading him 
when I was a Protestant and seeing a whole lot of things in him that is very, very Catholic. And he's a really early figure. I mean, I think he actually knew the Apostle John, if I'm not mistaken. And so here you have a guy who's within living memory of the Apostles who is saying some really Catholic things about the Eucharist and bishops and stuff like that. And I was really struck by that. And what I, what I also found interesting is that I wondered, well, how did some of the reformers explain this? And then it turns out that individuals like Calvin evidently didn't have access to these things. Evidently, this was something that um, we discovered a little bit later. Can you maybe speak to that a little bit? Yeah, that is uh, that is the case. You know, specifically with the letters of Ignatius of Antioch, um, they somebody somebody like the, you know the reformers may not have ever read them, mm -hmm. uh, or if they did, they may have read them. You know, read just excerpts. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually different versions of these letters. So, like for example, with the letters of Ignatius, there's a short version, a middle version, and a long version. And mm -hmm. you know, uh, near as we can figure, the middle version is the original. There are short versions that are that are edited, um, and then there are long versions that were embellished, right? So, so that sort of thing goes on as well. But, um, but yeah, it, it is definitely true that when you read the Church Fathers, you will realize just how Catholic the early Church is, and it's you know it's hard to deny. Now, the next section you talk about early Christian worship and the sacraments. Can you talk about the Church Fathers and maybe what their worship and sacraments were like? Yeah, it's hard to nail down what worship was like in the early church. And, mm -hmm. um, and and part of the reason for that is the early church fathers didn't really write down that much. Um, there was probably uh, a, a good amount of, of diversity across the empire, from, from one end of the empire to the other in, in the church in terms of, you know, what was going on in an actual liturgy. Um and, uh, you know, we, we get little hints as early as a, there's a document called the Didache, mm. which is uh, probably contemporary with some of the later New Testament documents. We get, we get early hints of Eucharistic prayers there, but mm. not much more than that. Um, then we get a few more hints in Justin Martyr writing in the middle of the second century, about 150. But he's not writing to Christians to say, this is how you do worship. He's writing to pagans to say, this is what we do in our meetings so that to try and convince them that they're not doing anything, you know, subversive against the, the government. Um, so it's it's difficult to put together exactly what they were doing uh, in liturgy. But, um, but we know that somewhere in this early period, the Eucharist itself gets moved uh, from a part of an evening agape meal into mm -hmm a morning ritual, right, a liturgy. Um, but whether that happened, when exactly that happened, we're not exactly sure. It seems to have already happened by the time uh, Ignatius of Antioch is writing, so by the by the beginning of the second century. But um, hard to pin that down. Um, as far as the sacraments, it's interesting to, to uh, sort of track the development of the sacraments, too. Um, you know, one of the things that that people might not understand, and, and you know, you probably know this, but um, you know, in in the Eastern Church, um, baptism and confirmation are mm -hmm. still one thing, right? right? Sure. But in the in the Western Church, those get separated uh, somewhere around the third century, and there are reasons for that, and it's a legitimate development. But at the same time, when you read the earliest Church Fathers they talk about baptism and confirmation either as one thing or after a while they start talking about that dual sacrament, that double sacrament. And then, it, and then they start talking about them as two sacraments. And so it's interesting to sort of track that. And there's a similar trajectory with regard to the Eucharist and confession, hmm. because um, even though the sacrament of confession and reconciliation, as we know of it, took a little while to develop and, and it gets formalized out of a controversy in the third century. Before that time, it, it was still sort of understood to be a part of the Eucharist. Like you, you simply would not expect to receive the Eucharist without confessing your sins in some way. So, so just like baptism and confirmation were sort of one sacrament at the beginning, 
the Eucharist and confession were kind of one thing at the beginning. You confessed your sins before receiving the Eucharist. So, um, so they they really have a, a very sort of organic way of looking at these things, and they're 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 not necessarily compartmentalizing them. So, um, yeah. would they have received absolution during the liturgy, or is that unclear? It's it's unclear, and I think that um, I, I think that there there have always been some kind of confessional prayers built into the Eucharistic liturgy. Mm -hmm. And there's always been an assumption that venial sins as what we call venial sins would be covered mm -hmm. by the reception of the Eucharist by participating in the liturgy. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the tricky part is, you know, what about mortal sins? Mm -hmm. And that is another whole story in itself, you know, in terms of like, um, very, very early in the church, there seems to be an assumption by some of the church fathers that, you know, well, of course, Christians aren't going to commit mortal sin after their baptism. Mm -hmm. And then, whoops, they do. And mm -hmm. now what do we do? And so how do we deal with that? And so um, the sort of formal, formalized sacrament of, of confession and reconciliation with absolution, as we know it today, you know, sort of emerges out of that question of, you know, what do we do about post-baptismal mortal sin, right? And that's, you know, that that's a kind of a um, a development that, that we can see taking place over the first few centuries. Certainly. Now, you then shift gears and you talk about uh, Christology and Logos Christology in the post-apostolic age. Can you maybe explain to us what exactly that is and what was Christology like in the early church? Well, you know, you have to remember that it all comes down to this. Mm -hmm. Christ has two natures. Mm -hmm. It is always about the two natures of Christ. Right. And, um, you know, from the beginning, there is this conviction. And it's, of course, it's in Scripture. It's in the New Testament. So it's not surprising. But from the very beginning, there's this conviction within the church that Jesus Christ is fully human and also fully divine. And you can't compromise on either one of those, right? Mm -hmm. But the heresies, the heresies of the early church, uh, especially at the beginning, generally have to do with either sort of emphasizing his humanity and diminishing his divinity, or the opposite, emphasizing his divinity and diminishing his humanity. And so what you get are the, um, the, the teachers of these heresies are sort of zoning in on some scriptures and ignoring others, right? So, uh, and, and so what the, the church fathers do is they say, well, you know, you, you don't get to do that. You can't pick and choose among the scriptures. Hmm. And you certainly can't pick and choose among the things that Jesus said about himself. For example, you know, the father and I are one, but also the father is greater than I, right? Like how can both of those things be true? Well, you don't get to pick one and, and, you know, ignore the other. You have to accept them both as true. And so, so Christology from the very beginning is all about Jesus Christ must have these two natures, fully human, fully divine. And then it becomes a matter of explaining how that's possible, or at least to the extent that we can understand it, you know. It sure seems like it took a little while for us to do that in the early church. It's like every one of the ecumenical councils is dealing with one Christology issue, which then leads to more, and then another is called to deal with that one, and so on and so forth. Well, sure, sure. And of course, you know, once you start to say, well, you know, this this person we know as Jesus Christ is is not only a real human, but he's also fully divine. Once you say that, then the next question is, well, wait a minute, what does that say about God then? right? Do we have two gods? Well, no, we don't. Of course, you know, that's the right answer. But how do you explain the fact that, you know, that, that God can be three persons and yet still only a single divinity, right? So then you get the whole uh, clarification of the doctrine of the Trinity, and that, mm -hmm. that becomes a controversy that has to be, uh, that, that has to be explained and settled. Yeah. And, you know, one of the ways they settled this was they would go to sacred scripture. So talk to me a little bit about patristic exegesis, how they approached sacred scripture, and maybe how it also differs a little bit from how people tend to do today. Yeah, well, it's it's um, it's very interesting. And, you know, the, the chapter in this book on on the the canon, 
the New Testament and patristic exegesis, how they how they read the scriptures. Um, that chapter I actually ended up expanding into um, mm -hmm. my most recent book, reading scripture like the early church. So, mm -hmm. um, so the way the early Christians read scripture, if you can think of it like as a spectrum, on one end of the spectrum, you have the idea that scripture is just kind of a, a another piece of human literature. It's, you know, it's just the product of human creativity, not really inspired by God. That's one extreme. But there's another extreme. On the other extreme of that spectrum is the idea that, you know, the human author goes into a trance and when they wake up, the Bible is written and, you know, everything is just um, like inspired by God to the extent that there's no human, um, the, the, you know, there's no human contribution to it and, and that there's no human context to it. And, you know, that usually, that extreme usually sort of leads to a very, what we might call a very literalistic reading of scripture. Uh, we might associate that with a fundamentalist reading of scripture. Uh, so if you have these two extremes, the church fathers were right down the middle. They, they understood how to read the scriptures because they're so much closer in time, especially to the New Testament. They're, they're, they're taking their clues from the apostles themselves. So they understood how to read the scriptures as, you know, inspired by God and infallible and trustworthy, but also as um, having a context and not always meant to be taken what we would call literally. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and, and they, they have to be interpreted and interpreting the scriptures is not always easy. It's not always what's right there on the surface. And they understood that. And so, um, so it, it's it's really interesting how there's this sort of beautiful, uh, you know, middle way of understanding uh, orthodoxy and and the and the scriptures that are kind of like that lives between the extremes of the heresies. Mm. Now, one topic that is dear to my heart is ecclesiology. That is the way the church functions and is structured. Tell me a little bit about Catholic ecclesiology in the patristic age. Yeah, well, of course, you know, the, the patristic age is specifically that age when the word church mm -hmm. does not mean a building or even an institution, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you can't walk down the street and see a church, not until probably the fourth century. Uh, so what is what does that word ecclesia mean, you know? Um, and I really believe, based on my research, that the early Christians associated the church with the Eucharistic table. The church is the table. Now, granted, membership in the church is accessed through baptism. So there's a certain um, sense in which uh, a person becomes a member of the church when they're baptized. Um, but in a very real sense, the church is that mystical body of Christ that meets at the Eucharistic table to receive the Eucharist. Not only those doing this in this moment, but those who have always ever done it and those who are, you know, sort of already at the heavenly banquet, I guess, uh, you know, so there's this, there's a real element of the communion of saints involved here. Um, but I think, I think patristic ecclesiology is all about the Eucharist and it's all about who is, who is coming to that Eucharistic table. Yeah. So, I mean, how could that maybe impact the way we view ecclesiology today? Are, are there maybe some insights there that we could glean? Well, you know, I'm, I'm sure there is. And, you mm -hmm. know, we find ourselves in a, in a time of um, we're, we're supposed to be having a Eucharistic revival yeah. right now. Um, and, you know, part of, uh, of course, part of the stated problem here is that we have um, – <clears throat> You know, we have a situation where perhaps people identify as Catholics who don't necessarily believe the teaching of the church about the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I could I could go on and on about this because I, you know, I, I believe that most people, most lay people who don't believe in the real presence, don't believe it because they don't understand it. If they understood mm -hmm. it, they would they would probably believe it. Um, but I think, you know, if we want to go back to the early church for some some guidance on uh, on all of this. I would go back to the fact that 
you know, the church fathers absolutely did believe and teach the real mm -hmm. presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. There is no question about it. And the ironic thing about this is there's all kinds of controversy over the doctrine of the Trinity in yep. the early church. Yep. Um, and, and it took it, it took ecumenical councils to settle it. It took writing the Nicene Creed. And we now consider the doctrine of the Trinity one of the most important doctrines in the church. There is no controversy over the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist until about the ninth century. And then it's really about something else. So there is just this great consensus in the early church and among the church fathers that, you know, in favor of, um, you know, what we would call the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and what comes to be called later the doctrine of transubstantiation. I mean, you know, the, the word transubstantiation is, is a medieval word that was coined to describe what the church has always believed, right? So, um, you know, so they didn't really have the word transubstantiation in, in the early church, but it that is what they believed, properly understood. So um, but for me, I think if, if we want to... Um, if we want to enhance our ecclesiology, we we need to first enhance our understanding of the Eucharist and mm. um, and and get back to the place where we talk about Eucharistic theology and we get our people on board with you know with truly believing in the real presence in the Eucharist. What what was their structure ecclesiolog ecclesiological structure like on the <clears throat> local level were they pretty consistent in having bishops priests and deacons or was it more of kind of a presbyters and deacons thing well it's it's a little tricky because um you know in the first uh generation or two of the church and especially in in the documents like in the new testament in the didache um the words, those Greek words that we translate bishop, episkopos, and um, and and priest or presbyter, presbyteros. And and by the way, I know my Greek pronunciation is not great. I'm Italian. Give me a break. Um, but uh, but anyway, those words are virtually synonymous. So in the early generations of the church, these words like bishop and and pastor, bishop, priest, they they mean pastor. And and when you think about it. In the early generations of the church, you know, take a city like Corinth. If there's only one parish, if there's only one house church in Corinth, well, then the priest is the bishop, right? You don't really need to make that distinction. So eventually, though, when the apostles die off um, and when, when cities begin to have multiple house churches, multiple parishes within a city, you know, then one of those priests becomes sort of the the chair of the council of priests in that town, and that is the bishop. That is the origin of our office of bishop, and they are the successors to the apostles because, you know, the the, the apostles, wherever possible, would have chosen their own successors. And where no apostle was available to choose a successor, then they may have chosen someone by election or whatever, but it takes a while for all of that to sort of be sorted out and formalized. Um, mm -hmm. But I, but yeah, you know, like by by the second century, and and by by the time we get into the the next generation or so, it really does fall out into that sort of three tier, um, the hierarchy of bishop, mm -hmm. priest, and deacon. Um, it it takes longer for them to figure out what to call them mm -hmm. than it does for the hierarchy to develop. So in the early stages you can see a couple of the church fathers experimenting with, you know, well, should we call it high priest, priest, and Levite, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but then that doesn't stick. And so, you know, it, it's yeah. There. yeah. Yeah. So talk to me about the papacy. What, what was the function and role of the Pope in the early church? Well, I mean, the, you know, the, the Pope is the Bishop of Rome. The Pope has always been and always will be the Bishop of Rome primarily. And so, um, the, the other thing to keep in mind is that the word pope mm -hmm. is an English word that is just one version of the ancient languages words for father, papa, or patriarch. These words all mean exactly the same thing. So on the one hand, 
the uh, you you have the Bishop of Rome, you know, very early on uh, taking on a, a level of authority above other bishops, and we can see this already in the letter of Clement of Rome, written you know, in about the last decade of the first century, about the same time as the book of Revelation, I would say about 95 AD, Clement writes this letter to the Christians in Corinth claiming an authority over them, All right? So you have that. But on the other hand, you also have the, you know, the development of the sort of metropolitan bishops. So there are there are other bishops in other major cities that have a level of authority over the bishops in the smaller towns around them. Mm -hmm. and, and they are also called patriarch or papa or pope. And so, you know, it's it's maybe the fourth century or so before, or maybe, the, maybe even the fifth century before the Bishop of Rome is the only bishop who holds that title. Mm. Um, but of course, by this time, the authority of the Bishop of Rome as sort of first among equals, as we would say, is pretty well established. Uh, but then, you know, the as far as the other bishops are concerned, the farther from Rome you are, the more you can sort of get away with ignoring what the Bishop of Rome is saying. And um, and then, of course, by, you know, by the by the Middle Ages, we already have the, the beginnings of the split between East and West. And so, uh, you know, where that goes. Yeah, absolutely. Now let's uh, let's shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about uh, the Council of Nicaea, which you discuss. You discuss, of course, Christology in that period and the importance of the Council of Nicaea. Um, can you talk to us what exactly was going on then? Why was this council called? Why was it important? Stuff like that. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's important for a couple of different reasons. Um, you know, one of which was that, you know, it just happened to be at that moment in history when Christianity had just been legalized and an emperor had come to power who was identifying with Christianity. So you have the emperor Constantine and we could do a whole show on, you know, Constantine's personal faith. Was he a Christian, you know, et cetera. But, um, but the point is, is that, you know, that since the church found itself now in, in a position where it was not only legal, but actually kind of favored, the church had the means to have a council where they could literally invite every bishop in the world. Now, they didn't all come, um, but, uh, but hundreds of bishops were there. And so in, you know, as, as the church looked at this in hindsight, it became considered an ecumenical council, ecumenical meaning worldwide, in the sense that uh, this was not just a regional council. If you had a regional council in Spain, well, then the decisions of that council are binding on the churches in Spain. But this is a worldwide council because, you know, the since every bishop in the world was invited, whether they came or not, the decisions of this council will be binding on worldwide Christianity, all of Christianity for all time. And, and, you know, obviously the other major reason why it's such a big deal is because um, with the controversy over the doctrine of the Trinity uh, and the writing of the Nicene Creed, this, you know, in a very real way, the Council of Nicaea defined what Christianity is, mm -hmm. what it was going to be and what it was not going to be. Um, and so in writing the Nicene Creed and, and sort of really clarifying the doctrine of the Trinity, and by the way, nothing was new here at the Council of Nicaea. You know, forget about all those myths about, you know, Constantine forcing anything on the council. That never happened. Forget about all those myths about, you know, they made up words at the council. That never happened. There are some words that hadn't been used in a creed before. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so we can talk about that. But the point is, is that... Uh, Everything in the Nicene Creed is based on what the theologians of the church fathers had said before, and you know, and they were just putting it all together. But in doing that, they literally defined Christianity itself. And um, and as I always tell my students, they, you know, they defined it in a way that no one living today has the authority to change. Right? This is the historic definition of Christianity. So. To reject the Nicene Creed is to be something other than Christian. I mean, it's that simple. 
Mm -hmm. Now you have a section here, the church after Constantine. Talk, talk to us a little bit about his importance. And also what was the church like after that? Did he just radically change everything as we tend to hear in popular history? No, I mean, there's so many myths about Constantine and, and uh, you know, they're, they're, they're all based on, uh, you know, a couple of things like not having actually studied church history or read the church fathers or the history of the church before Constantine. And right. also they're based on a kind of an anti-church bias, you know, that wants to pretend that uh, there's something illegitimate about, you know, the way the church developed and the way doctrine was clarified. But, you know, there are some things we could talk about with regard to the church after Constantine in the sense that, you know, after Constantine, we do begin to see um, Christian bishops taking on some of the authority of, of civil magistrates, judges. This is the origin of why, you know, clergy can um, sign off on a marriage license to this day, right? Because, because Constantine gave Christian bishops some of the rights of judges, presumably so that if two Christians had a, had a, a beef, a lawsuit, they wouldn't have to go to a pagan judge to settle their lawsuit. But um, but bishops start to gain some real um, authority in the culture at this point. Uh, the ordination or the consecration of bishops starts to take on a lot of sort of pomp and circumstance um, at this time. And, uh, and you know, there, there are going to be issues even surrounding some of the future ecumenical councils with... Um, the 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 political power of bishops and and patriarchs and how you know some of them vie for power and and uh, and you know this is this is actually one of the reasons one of the big reasons why the non Chalcedonian Christians you know mm -hmm. our Coptic mm -hmm. brothers and sisters and the others split from the church after the Council of Chalcedon in 451 mm -hmm. because there was so much political stuff going on behind the scenes at that mm -hmm. point so. For what it's worth, uh, so so there are things that happen after Constantine. Another thing that happens after Constantine is you, there's never again going to be any debate about whether Christians can serve in the military. Mm -hmm. Before Constantine, that was a question: Can a Christian be a soldier? Should a should a soldier who becomes a Christian quit being a soldier? Right. Well, once Constantine becomes emperor, that debate goes away because. If, if anyone were to say no Christian can be a soldier, but the, but the emperor wants the empire to be Christian, who's going to fight in the legions, right? So sure. that question goes away, and then it becomes legitimate for a Christian to be a soldier. And then eventually you get Augustine and the whole concept of, of just war theory. Uh, well, okay, so under what conditions then can a Christian participate in war and all of that? Um, but that's another question that comes up because – the, the empire, by, by the end of the fourth century, the empire will be officially Christian. Constantine didn't do that. He only made Christianity legal. But by the end of the fourth century, the empire will be officially Christian. So that's going to be a consideration. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about monasticism in the early desert fathers. Right. Well, so, you know, we see during the time that Christianity is illegal, we see mm. um, a lot of martyrdoms. Mm. And, you know, we, we see Christians who are faced with the choice to deny the faith uh, or, or perhaps be tortured or executed. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as you know, I mean, we have a long tradition of who the martyrs are, and these are, these are the first uh, saints of the church. And, um, and that becomes a thing. So, but once Christianity is legalized and, and martyrdom goes way down, um, a couple of things happen. One thing that happens is we will see Christians get disillusioned with the way Christianity and culture are kind of starting to dovetail, right? Um, you know, in some ways, Christianity is influencing culture and the empire. In other ways, People start to worry that the culture is going to influence the church. And so we have these hermits who mm. decide that the way to deal with this is to, is to abandon the culture, leave society, leave the city, and, and they, they move out of the city. And in progressive steps, first they move out to the edge of the city and make a camp right outside the city walls. Mm. 
Then they start moving out to the to the necropolis, the the tombs, and living in the cemeteries. And then they go further out into the desert. Um, but eventually, they start to sort of group together and form communities. Those communities become monasteries. And so I'm oversimplifying it, but that's sort of the trajectory you see. And then, so what happens is, is that monasticism, the idea of dying to yourself daily as a lifestyle of self-denial, that becomes sort of the new martyrdom. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, and, and then we start to see the idea of sainthood expanded to, to the ascetics, to the, the hermits and the monks and the nuns. Yeah. White martyrdom, as, as they call exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. As opposed to the red martyrdom where you actually bleed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fascinating. Now, you have one other section. Well, actually, you have two more sections. But one, the next section, you talk about the end of the patristic age. What are some events and things that happened during that period that characterize this time period? Well, you know, that's a good question. I, it, and it, depending on who you ask, you might get a different answer on when does the patristic age end? Patristics, right, is, you know, the for people who might not catch that, uh, the word for uh, the church fathers, the fathers. When does the age of the church fathers end? Um, and uh, again, you know, opinions vary on this, but, uh, but we see, for example, with, I mentioned the Council of Chalcedon, that was in the year 451 AD. And before Chalcedon, you always had this situation where, you know, the church fathers could write some documents, there could be a debate, and if that didn't work, you had a council. But, you know, at the very least, a council would settle the debate, mm -hmm. and then you'd know what the heresy is, and you'd know what orthodoxy is, and you, you move on from there. But with the Council of Chalcedon, for the first time, we had a situation where the council ended, but instead of the heretics sort of getting on board with orthodoxy, they left. They walked and, and started their own separate thing. And so after the Council of Chalcedon, we have the creation of the first schismatic or the first, the first permanent schisms of the church. Um, and some of those movements still exist today in what we call the non-Chalcedonian churches. Now, we don't call them heretics anymore, and there are reasons for that. Um, and so we, we consider them legitimate Christians, uh, but these are the Oriental Orthodox, including the Coptics, uh, the Assyrian Church of the East. So, um, so, so one of the ways you could define the end of the patristic era is, you know, sort of the end of an era when, when debate and council could settle the matter without schism, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we find ourselves in the middle of the fifth century with the first schism, um, you know, we're, we're kind of on a new road. Also, the, the Roman Empire splits, not just uh, in terms of the church, but politically with the, uh, with the invasions in the West and the Byzantine Empire in the East. And the more the Western and Eastern parts of the empire become disconnected from each other, the more we are moving into what, what we would call the Middle Ages, um, where Europe and the West becomes kind of isolated. So that would be another way to sort of think about the end of the patristic age. Um, and then for me also, I think th there's a certain sense in which, you know, by the, by the fifth century, the doctrinal questions are answered. Um, the big questions have been sort of nailed down to the point where doctrine has developed and to the point where we can clarify these things. And, you know, there's obviously, you know, more discussion that goes on after that time, but it, you know, in some ways it becomes talking more about minor issues. Uh, the major issues uh, are, are really clarified, I think, um, even with the first three ecumenical councils, uh, Nicaea um, in 325, Constantinople in 381, and Ephesus in 431. I think uh, after that time, we know what the church is. We know what Christianity is. We know what orthodoxy is. Not again, not because they've made up anything new, but because mm -hmm. they've clarified, um, you know, the the church's beliefs that have stood the test of time. Now you have one last section here, uh, looking forward, and let me let's see here, looking forward and coming full circle is how you put it. Tell me a little bit about why you added this section and what it's about. Well, you know, I, I mean. I have to admit, part of the reason I added this section is because my intro class has to go up to a certain point. Mm 
Yeah. So I take it up to Aquinas, although I, uh, the, you know, my book does not do justice to Aquinas. Uh, it's a, just an introduction, but, um, but the reason I take it up to that point is because I wanted to deal with the question of the atonement, mm -hmm. the atonement being, you know, sort of the nuts and bolts of how salvation works. And the reason I call this coming full circle is because what, you know, what the medieval scholastics like Anselm and Aquinas will say is that the atonement works precisely because of what the church fathers have been insisting on from the very beginning, which is that Christ has two natures, mm -hmm. right? It requires two natures in Christ for our, for us to be saved. He has to be human so that he can become one of us and represent us on the cross. Um, but he also has to be divine so that he can actually do something about the problem, right? Now, it's obviously more complicated than that, but that's that's the idea. So that's why it comes full circle, back to that initial question of the two natures of Christ. Now, there are a couple of questions here. I want to just grab them from the chat. This one is from Rob. He says, question for Dr. Jim, where can we find the main primary sources for Roman Catholic Church fathers? Well, you know, um, there are a lot of books that kind of uh, outline who the church fathers are, and, and I do that in this book. So mm -hmm. if you if you read this book, you'll you'll be introduced to all the church fathers. Um, if you go to my website, jimpapandrea.com, I have a tab called Primary Sources mm -hmm. where I actually list all the important, uh, what I think are the most important documents of the church fathers, and they all mm -hmm. have links to where you can read English versions of them online. Some of the translations are a little antiquated, um, mm. so you got to wade through some these and thous. Um, and also, I'll just a little caveat here for the Catholics. Um, some of those old translations of the Church Fathers were made 100 years ago by Protestants. So there are times yeah. when the translation is tweaked in a Protestant direction. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you get the Fathers of the Church uh, or the, um, the Anti-Nicene, Nicene Fathers, uh, these, these up yep. here, mm -hmm. um, the footnotes are super biased toward, oh, yeah. toward the Reformation. <laughs> Right. So just FYI. But uh, but yeah, yeah. I uh, noticed that as well. <laughs> so here's another one from Rob. Uh, thoughts on how to identify the consensus of the fathers. Do most Catholic saints agree on everything? <laughs> that Yeah, that is not only a great question. That is the question, because when we read the church fathers, right, you cannot proof text the church fathers. Uh, you know, I always say, you know, if if there was one verse in the Bible only one verse in the Bible that told us that, you know, reading, uh, riding a bicycle was a sin. That's all you'd need. Don't ride a bicycle. Right. But you can't do that with the church fathers. They're not inspired on the, on the level that scripture is, and they are sometimes wrong about things. So to your point, what you're, what we're looking for in the church fathers is consensus. You cannot just mine the church fathers for proof texting because you're going to stumble on the outliers and believe it or not, even somebody like St. Augustine was wrong about things sometimes. So we're looking for consensus. Now, you can't necessarily say that they all agreed about everything. There are some things they agree on, and you can find consensus. There are other things where there's no consensus, and that sort of gives you permission to say, okay, there's a range of beliefs that are possible here. Um, and there are other times where you have to be careful because they will they will state something so emphatically and they will say, well, everybody knows that X, Y, Z. And then you got to be like, mm, me thinks he doth protest too much. And you have to think maybe that maybe that overly emphatic tone of confidence is really compensating for something because they want you to believe them so bad because there isn't agreement on that issue or or, or there isn't yet, or there should be, but some, but there's a heretic out there who's questioning it. So it really takes kind of um, a very broad understanding of what the church fathers in general said. So you can, you can hear one against the other. Um, so in some ways it, it does take some, some, uh, some work to understand what the church fathers are saying, but, but anybody can read them They're You know, they're out there for you to read for sure. Yeah, very accessible. Here's one from Dr. Richard DeClue. Could you speak about Arianism after Nicaea? Did it remain prevalent? When did it finally cease? 
Right. Well, so Arianism, uh, for those who who maybe don't know, was the was the main heresy that was the cause of the Council of Nicaea. And Arius was was a priest who who was basically teaching a version of that thing where you know I said some people were were emphasizing Jesus's humanity but diminishing his divinity. Arius was teaching a version of that, but kind of a modified version of it, where he was sort of saying, well, he's kind of divine, but not as divine as the Father. So that's why we have that stuff in our creed, like he is consubstantial with the Father, same divinity, same eternity. That's what that means. You know, he's uh, he's um, begotten, but not made. He's not created. All that stuff is in the creed specifically to refute Arius. So Arius and the others who were teaching that after the Council of Nicaea were either sort of, you know, made to sign off on Nicaea and stop teaching that heresy, or they were exiled. They weren't executed. Nobody's nobody's murdering heretics at this point. Um, that comes a lot later. Uh, but they were they were exiled. But um, but the problem was that those. Some of those Arians, especially the bishops, like Eusebius of Nicomedia, not the Eusebius who wrote the ecclesiastical history, the other one, mm-hmm. Eusebius of Nicomedia, these guys remained in good in the good graces of the imperial family. Eusebius of Nicomedia, an Arian bishop, is the one who actually baptized Constantine on his deathbed. So they were able to influence one or two of Constantine's sons to try and promote Arianism again after the council. And they tried to push it to the West. And there's a famous story of uh, St. Ambrose and St. Augustine's mother, St. Monica, organizing a sit-in in a, in a basilica in Milan to prevent the Eastern emperor from grabbing that basilica and giving it to the Arians. So, so they tried to push Arianism West and it does catch on in Spain because mm-hmm. the the, uh, the barbarians the, who who invaded Spain and took over there were Arians, and so it, it took a while. Um, and you know, this is one of the reasons why why we add the added the filioque to our creed was to try to suppress Western Arianism in that time period when it was when it kept you know rearing its head. Um, it, it, it doesn't really go away until. Oh my gosh! I, I mean, I guess until um, you know the until Charlemagne. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it lingers around for a while. <laughs> yeah. uh, Roberto asks, "Why do most Protestant denominations overlook or just don't bother to encourage reading or study in the Church Fathers?" Do you have uh, any thoughts on that? Sure, um, I have thoughts on pretty much everything. So, <laughs> um, no, well, there's there's two reasons. So, mm. so. Um, the a lot of the Protestant reformers, when they said they were reading the Church Fathers, they were really reading Augustine. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned earlier, I said even Saint Augustine was wrong about some things. And the the ironic thing about all this is that the reformers latched on to exactly those bits in Augustine that the Church rejected. Yeah, parts where Augustine was wrong, mm-hmm. predestination, right limited atonement. I mean, the whole tulip thing. Uh, I've got a video about that where two of my colleagues and I discussed this. Um, so so that's a big part of it. So, um, you know, someone like Calvin would be going back to Augustine, pulling out the stuff that, that the church rejected in Augustine and saying, this is what the early church was like. Well, it wasn't. Augustine is the outlier on that point. And everybody before Augustine wasn't saying that. Um, so, uh, so, so that's, you know, I, I think a big part of it, but you know, the other part is I, I really don't think that apart from Augustine, I really don't think the, the reformers read the church fathers. Hmm. I think they had an assumption and this is the myth, you know, when I was coming up, I grew up Protestant. This is the myth I was told that, that, you know, the Catholics had added things mm-hmm. and the Protestant reformation was all about getting back to um, the original version of Christianity before the Catholics added things, so, like as if there's some sort of pre-Catholic version of Christianity. And I, I think this is this seems to me what they really thought they were doing. They, um, but the problem is, is that the more you study the early church, there is no time window for that. There is no such thing as a 
pre-Catholic Christianity because the earliest documents are very Catholic. So, um, but this myth just keeps getting propagated in the in the Protestant world. Um, you know that there's that, that that this is some kind of you know original version of Christianity, but it didn't exist. Got another one here for you about Catholicism and Protestantism from Haley Luya. Some Protestant apologists say you can dismiss things by the fathers of the church, but accept other things. What is the difference between how Catholic scholars and Protestant ones do this? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, first of all, there there is some truth to the, to the um, idea that, you know, there are some things in the church fathers that, that we don't necessarily need to take to heart for our own faith. Mm-hmm. Um, and so again, that gets back to the, the context and the consensus to know what we have to, you know, what was sort of like binding on us and what isn't, or what is authoritative and what isn't. But, you know, in a lot of ways, the magisterium of the church has done a lot of that work for us and helps us with that. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I think that there is this, uh, let me put it this way. There is a kind of a Bermuda triangle of danger when it comes to reading the church fathers, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and this Bermuda Triangle has three corners. One corner is, you know, you get you get scholars who are skeptical, very they're, they're skeptics, maybe they're not even Christians, maybe they're anti-Catholic, maybe they're anti-church, but they come to it with this skepticism um, and they bring a skepticism to the primary sources that, that makes them see only the bad in the history of the church. Um, or you get very pious, well-meaning, faithful Catholics who are just proof texting and mining the church fathers for anything that supports the you know, current Catholic teaching, right? But they're not looking at the evidence in a scholarly way, and they're not seeing the things they don't want to see. Hmm. Or the third corner of the Bermuda Triangle is well-meaning Protestants who are doing the same thing, but they're mining the church fathers for what they want to find. Um, and they have a sort of anti-Catholic bias when they're doing it. And so they're not seeing the evidence of just how Catholic the early church is. And they're projecting the Reformation back into the early church. Hmm. And you really have to navigate carefully these waters of, with that, so that you don't fall into this, this sort of Bermuda Triangle. Because, um, it, because I guess, you know, the bottom line is, that it it is it is an easy temptation to fall into to ignore the evidence we don't want to see and only find the evidence that supports what we already believed when we started reading um and you have to you have to be careful of that and you know to be fair we all do it it's we are all tempted to do this um and the you know the protestants who can't see how catholic the early church is well you know that's what they're doing um the catholics who who want to find, you know, everything about, you know, their ideal version of Catholicism in the early church. Well, they're doing the same thing. And there are times when I have to say to Catholics, I know this isn't what you want to hear, but, you know, so, yeah. (laughs) Well, you wrote a very helpful resource for how we can navigate through the church fathers, make a better sense of the patristic period. So thank you so much for this, everybody, and go and get it. Reading the Church Fathers by Dr. Jim Pampadrea. Again, I have a link to it there in the show notes. Any uh, final words, plugs that you want to put in, stuff like that? Uh, You know, if if people want more of me, I am doing a weekly Bible study where I'm we're going through the, the four Gospels concurrently, and we're mm-hmm. looking at how how the early Christians, how the church fathers would have interpreted the New Testament. We're going to track through the whole New Testament. Um, we're doing that on Locals.com, so look for the original church community on Locals. And if you feel like joining me there, uh, you know, like I said, I'm doing that Bible study every week. Perfect. I'll put a link to that in the, the description. Thanks. Thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Jim. Always an honor. My pleasure. It's always fun, and I hope we can do it again soon. I'd love to have you back on. You're always welcome. All right, let's do it. Everybody hit the like button and the subscribe button. And of course, check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support me. We'll see you later. God bless. Hey, everybody just wanted to tell you about my new free ebook, 
Church Chaos, Biblical Insights for Confused Catholics. If you are a confused Catholic and you're thinking about leaving the Catholic Church or you're thinking about converting to the Church, but you see that there's a crisis in the Church and you're just unsure, this is the book for you. Again, it is free. Just simply go to reasonandtheology.com. You'll see a pop-up that comes up on your screen. Just simply click on it and you'll put in your email and it will provide you the free PDF ebook right then and there. Please check it out if you're confused about the situation in the Catholic Church today.